premier Chinese vulnerability researchers, as well as international uh, vulnerability researchers, come to China and they demonstrate that they can break into some of probably the most secure Western tech around. We're talking about iPhones, Androids, Windows machines, you know, most up-to-date systems that there are available. And instead of other hacking competitions internationally that say, great, now that you've demonstrated this, we'll go talk to the vendor so that way they can patch it, all of these vulnerabilities first go through <laughs> the government, the Chinese government. I am Eugenia Lohtri, Lawfare's Fellow in Technology Policy and Law, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 5th, 2024. In mid-February, Chinese cybersecurity firm iSoon appeared to suffer a massive data leak, which offered unprecedented insight into the operations of the company, known to contract for many Chinese government agencies. The more than 500 documents include conversations between employees, sales pitches, and internal documents, and expose the firm's hacking methods, tools, and their victims. They also show in what ways the offensive cyber industries in China and the US are surprisingly similar. I sat down with Winona de Somber Bernson, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council, to talk through the leaks and her research into the key similarities and differences between the Chinese companies and their Western counterparts. We talked about how the Chinese government hoards vulnerabilities, some of the similar contracting headaches that firms in the US and China suffer from, and how the findings from this leak can be used to develop better norms. It's the Law for Podcast for March 5th, The iSoon Leaks, with Winona the Sombra Bernson. So, Winona, last week you published an analysis of the iSoon Leaks that focused on the differences and similarities between the offensive cyber industry in the West and China. But before we dive into that comparison, could you start by providing a bit of context about these leaks? I'll say that, first off, conducting a cyber operation is a complicated thing, right? And not every country has the capability to do it in-house. Governments will often contract out the work to private actors. Uh, I'm sure you've heard companies like NSO Group or Positive Technologies that either build you the tool to conduct a cyber operation or actually conduct the operation itself. So... We're now seeing that China has quite a similar model, uh, despite a lot of focus on Israel and the Middle East. Uh, it's a global market for capabilities, and China has its own arsenal, too. Um, so on February 16th of this year, a set of internal documents, uh, chat logs, sales pitches, PDFs of internal tools belonging to Chinese security contractor Shanghai Anshun Information Co., uh, also known as iSoon. Um, they're a, a fairly medium-sized company uh, with offices in Chengdu, Shanghai, and a couple of other places that are known tech hubs in China. All of these documents got leaked onto code-sharing site GitHub. It's since been taken down, but multiple threat intel firms uh, have confirmed that a lot of the technical indicators within the leaks are connected not just to the company, I assume, but also to known Chinese threat actors. So APT41, for example, WinNTI Group, uh, they've been around for quite a long time, not just uh, targeting national security organizations here in the, the U.S., government targets, but also private organizations, uh, even gaming companies. So it's a very interesting set of documents that show kind of how the sausage is made, how the internal uh, workings of the, the Chinese private sector espionage mechanisms are. No, that's that's great. So we know that within these documents, we have like hacking methods, we have what are their targets, we have, you know, the relationship of companies to government agencies. Mm -hmm. When you look at these documents, what did you find that was surprising or new? Oh, that's such a good question. I think fundamentally, I was most surprised as to how similar <laughs> the Chinese uh, private mercenary space was in comparison to its Western counterparts. There were some key differences that are also important to highlight, but I think the similarities, particularly that it's a huge ecosystem of prime contractors and subcontractors working on government targets is particularly of interest. And we're going to get to all of those similarities and differences. But I, I want to stick with, you know, this kind of the context part for a little bit longer. Sure. I think in general, it's not very common for us, at least in the general public, to get access to this type of information and read about how cybersecurity companies in China operate. And 
you do mention this in your analysis, but Aizuni is not necessarily a premier hacking shop. I <laughs> think that's that's what you call it. Yeah. So how representative of the broader industry are these findings? How much can we extrapolate from what we know about how they operate to, well, this is how things work in China? Yes, I still stand by the fact that they are probably not the most premier hacking shop in China. Um, I referenced the Tamfu Cup, as well as some other competitions that might be a better metric for determining how great the capabilities of, a, of an average company are. I would say that they are not the worst either. I would say that they're probably about average. They have some interesting government-sponsored awards. They're large enough to have multiple offices. I think that it is representative for the average, although not necessarily the most concerning hacking group or, or company around. I, I did have a question on the tools and, and capabilities that you need as a researcher to conduct this type of analysis. When you find a trove of documents like this, what do you need in order to make sense of this? Because I was kind of surprised that given how much interest there is in the US about, you know, this great power competition with China, that, you know, we have seen it. I mean, of course, this has been in the news, but I, I was maybe expecting to see more coverage on the leaks. And I think it was very limited to some very specialized outputs and very specialized people. So why do you think we haven't seen more of the coverage? Certainly. I think in order to look at a set of leaks like this, you need a, a certain subset of knowledge that very few people in this industry have. Um, and it's a combination of the language skills, the technical knowledge, and the industry knowledge. There's maybe a couple of other China researchers that are also very good at this. I'll call out Dakota Carey over at Sentinel-1 as well as some other China hands who are continuing to look through this trove of documents, I think there's probably a lot less coverage right now because we're only seeing the start of what these leaks have to offer. A lot of the initial coverage, at least on Twitter and some of the other social media and news outlets, were based off of analysis conducted through machine learning translation, actually, and not through individual analysts going line by line and figuring out what all of the chat logs meant. So this meant that things like Tianfu Cup uh, was mistranslated in some of the original uh, English machine learning uh, outputs that someone who had a, a context of the industry and the Chinese language would actually be able to go in and double check. And because there's just so much in there, I think we'll continue to see uh, additional research in you know days, weeks, months to come. So turning now to your analysis, which, as we mentioned earlier, focuses on these differences and the similarities between the Western and Chinese offensive cyber capability industry. Let's start by maybe defining that scope, right? What falls under offensive cyber capabilities? What are these firms offering? Sure. Uh, so like I said earlier, creating the tools or, or capabilities necessary to conduct a cyber operation is a little complex. You need initial access into the target. You need a way to get the data out of that target environment, uh, either you know using mal malware and a command and control server or living off the land in some way. Uh, you also need someone who's capable of actually conducting the operation and is trained to do that sort of work. In the like cyber mercenary or spyware space, people talk a lot about uh, firms that provide all of these capabilities in an end-to-end -end software suite. That's the stuff that was talked about in the Summit for Democracy back in 2023, focusing on companies like NSO Group. And then there are the hack-for-hire firms <laughs> that do ostensibly all of these things and also will hack into these targets for you. When companies can't offer all of the services, though, uh, they will subcontract out different parts of this work, hence the, the prime subcontracting relationship. So say you have all of the pieces for an operation, but you don't have a zero-day vulnerability that will be able to get you into the target environment. You can go try and find a company that will sell you that capability and then plug that into the rest of your operation, right? You see that actually in the iSoon leaks, uh, and this goes back to the whole like how good is iSoon as a company? Uh, they don't have the capabilities to do very prolific or, or specific types of uh, zero-day vulnerability research. And so they contract out some of that work uh, to a firm called No Sugar Tech, uh, a specific vulnerability research shop. So the first similarity that you identify is that in both cases – 
these companies are large, sometimes venture-backed firms, and that they operate in a dense ecosystem, right? So uh, what information in the leaks exemplifies this? And maybe if you could tell us a bit more about similarities in processes, how this work, just talk a little bit more about that. So when we're talking about corporate ecosystems, <laughs> uh, vulnerability research is not cheap. Uh, it's not something that you can uh, sustain solely off of bug bounties, not not at this scale and, and for these sorts of clients anyway, uh, as well as these sorts of targets. And so a lot of companies in the West and uh, apparently in China require sometimes venture backing to be able to afford to pay their engineers before that first big government contract payout. So for um, iSoon specifically, they've received angel investment from a VC firm back in 2016, and they received Series A funding from a, uh, another capital firm, and then uh, Chihu360, which is a huge antivirus firm in China, also on the entity list in the U.S., in the leaks, the founders talk about Series B rounds, potential contacts to take them public, and revenue numbers. This is super similar to a smaller firm here in the United States that would sell these sorts of capabilities or, you know, anywhere in Europe. Going back to the fact that this is more of a mid, mid-size, mid-tier firm, the CEO claimed that their revenue in uh, 2021 reached 70 million yuan, which is about 9.7 million US dollars. Um, that's a lot of money if you're comparing it to like a firm of five people, but if you're comparing it to like NSO Group's lobbying budget here in the States, uh, it's not that, not that much. <laughs> now, for ISO to be a, a relatively average company, how, how many people do they employ? How many people does it take to run this? Yeah. So according to their documents, there are about 130 people spread out across four offices. So I would say, I guess, four smaller size companies or, or one larger one with, with four offices, right? I will say that they are well-placed to be very effective because of their prime contractor. Going back to the overall ecosystem, similarly to how, you know, L3 Harris tried to acquire NSO Group uh, <laughs> back in the day, iSoon has a prime contractor, similar to, you know, a, a Beltway Bandit or a, a defense contractor anywhere in the West. Their prime contractor is Qianxin. It's a huge cybersecurity and defense contractor. And it's very clear that within the, the leaks themselves, the founders have a very uh, sometimes good relationship if the money is flowing in, sometimes not so great, uh, which honestly, in the DC area, you could totally imagine a uh, subcontractor having the same complaints about their prime. I, I quite liked, um, there was a quote from Dave Itell on the Krebs overview, who was, you know, exactly saying this, that it was interesting just to see how the contracting headaches were very similar. And this was basically layers of contractors all the way down. So, so they are similar in that regard. What sort of concerns or what sort of contracting headaches were they experiencing? So there were a couple. Uh, one was getting the government contract to begin with, uh, which I imagine for any company uh, working with any government is a, a huge headache. Uh, there are also delays in payment, uh, different points of contact within the Chinese provincial governments leaving one position to go to the next, and therefore that relationship now needs to be rebuilt. A uh, very similar relationship building exercises that are done here when it comes to uh, you know pre-sales and sales relationships. No. Do you think these similarities are a sign of, you know, an averagely mature or a, a fairly mature cyber industry? Is this very different maybe in, in other places? Or, you know, like, are there governments that are relying on the script kitties uh, for their offensive cyber capabilities? I'll say yes. I'll say, though, that China does have an incredibly powerful technology and cybersecurity industry. And I would compare it more along the lines of a powerhouse like those of the NSO groups of the world rather than something like a dark caracol, uh, which is another like ostensibly potentially even just one person working on behalf of the Lebanese government. So I would say that when it comes to Looking at the cyber mercenary ecosystem as a whole, yes, there are script kitties, but I don't, I don't really see how that's as relevant to kind of the, the more dramatic ecosystem and, and dense ecosystem that China has, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. One of the other big similarities that you found is 
that there is a pipeline, right, from exercises like capture the flag, uh, hacking competitions to the recruitment of offensive talent. So how explicit is that pipeline? And, you know, I, I'm guessing here that there is an element of prestige that affects uh, talent recruitment. So how does that work? Yeah, I'll say that the hacking community is not a monolith anywhere. But there absolutely is a CTF to cybersecurity talent pipeline, not just, you know, in other Western countries, even in the States. The biggest, one of the biggest hacking conferences in the world, DEF CON, is hosted in Las Vegas every year in August. And the capture the flag teams that come and compete are some of the world's premier hacking talent. Tell us a little bit about what capture the flag looks like. So a capture the flag competition has many flavors, but is it is ostensibly a range in which, like a cyber range, in which you are competing against peers to either find flags that are hidden in the range itself for points, or like in the DEF CON CTF situation, you are actively defending infrastructure that is assigned to you while trying to exploit holes in your competitor's infrastructure. So there's multiple different ways to run a capture the flag competition, but ultimately the display of hacking talent is the end goal. Whoever is able to exploit the most weaknesses takes home the prize. And so when you're going to a a capture the flag uh, or you're developing a capture the flag, you're trying to create offensive security talent, be that for defensive purposes like red teaming, penetration testing, all of the well-known defensive cybersecurity use cases, or you're trying to develop offensive capabilities or people who are capable of developing those capabilities. To go back to your question about how uh, explicit this pipeline is, offensive companies in the West and in China will sponsor these capture the flags almost outright. They will bring hiring booths, they will bring their HR people, and they will say, hey, come work for us. We're a cool team. We helped even write some challenges uh, for the CTF itself. The offensive cybersecurity shops are quite plugged into the CTF and hacker ecosystem. Uh, They go to many of these offensive conferences, and they hire people who do well in these capture the flags. One of the things that you highlight is that Chinese firms, and, and this is the difference, that they seem to provide a more complete suite of services, right? And and those range from information operations, there's threat intelligence, there's hack for hire, and, and that is not as usual in Western countries. So what is it about the way the industry works in China that makes that a good bet for these companies? I'll say a couple things on that. The first is when you're a small company, you want to get whatever government contract you can to stay afloat. <laughs> So I imagine that the reason for some of these dual offerings are specifically so that way you can pay the bills. (laughs) I'll also say that I actually don't have an alternative hypothesis here. (laughs) Um, I think fundamentally, it's just less common in the States to consider developing this full suite. Uh, For example, the threat intel industry, uh, which is the industry that I used to be in, is somewhat siloed from the offensive talent industry. There's, you know, the the Google tags and the project zeros that work fairly closely together, but that might be the exception to the rule. In China, however, there seems to be a little bit more free flowing of this type of talent uh, and these types of offerings from different companies is what I'll say. Now, how good are they at offering all of these services? <laughs> Great question. Uh, I think that that goes back to the first hypothesis, right? Where if you're just trying to have a product that pays the bills, uh, you might not put as much time and effort into it as someone who has that as their primary offering, right? So in the ISIN leaks themselves, you see a lot of engineers complaining that maybe business priorities and engineering capacity isn't matching up. So it Yes, they're providing everything. Yes, there are probably companies out there that can provide everything, but at least for iSoon, uh, it doesn't seem to be working out as well. Well, it's it's not that different. I mean, I feel like (laughs) these these complaints are you know fairly regular. I'm going to stick with the with the differences here for a little bit longer. And you early on talk about 
how the differences in origin in the hacking communities frame or help frame how these companies relate with the government. So can you talk a little bit more about these different origins and how they end up shaping behavior and how those impact the industry? Sure. So going back to DEF CON, right, or, or any other um, Western hacking conference, there's a little bit more of a countercultural edge to it, right? Some of these original Western hackers, especially from the US, came from either a phone freaking background uh, or a kind of counterculture where the FBI or other law enforcement or the government was not exactly your friend. And uh, neither was Bell Labs <laughs> or uh, AT&T or some of these big firms that would try and get these hackers arrested or sue them, uh, etc. And so the original relationship that Western hackers are coming from takes a little bit of, of convincing that, you know, maybe it'll be great to work for the government. In China, however, it did not start the same way. <laughs> so you have the 2001 uh, U.S.-China hacker war as kind of one of the big ways that Chinese hackers exploded on the scene. And this came out of a kind of surge of patriotism after a U.S. spy plane collided with a Chinese fighter jet in the South China Sea. And a lot of Chinese hackers decided, okay, well, we're going to go DDoS and deface U.S. government websites. Why the heck is, is China in our space? Uh, let's show a display of patriotism. Now, this isn't to say that, you know, everybody in China is like a diehard patriot. Um, but the Chinese government has clearly over the last 20 some years been a lot better at co-opting that patriotism and co-opting these original hackers more into a, a space that's more aligned with Chinese government interests. Uh, so many of these original hackers are now CEOs or executives or senior engineers at huge tech and cybersecurity companies. I think the FBI in 2020, in their indictment against APT41, uh, the threat group I had mentioned previously, WinNTI group, claimed that one of these original hackers, um, Tan Dailin, who was DDoSing DOD sites back in 2006, is now a senior engineer at a company providing offensive services to the Chinese government. So that, that I guess, doesn't sound that different to me from the way in which we see now the U.S. government a attempting to maybe appeal to those countercultural hackers and and frame working for the government is maybe one of the coolest opportunities, one of the coolest challenges that that you could uh face as a as an engineer. I, what do you think of that? <laughs> I mean, I I color me a little bit skeptical that I think that <laughs> the US government has succeeded on that. Um sure, yes. I, I think that you see a lot more government officials, especially from the US, coming to DEF CON, engaging with uh hackers, showing them that it's cool to do mission, uh, which I, I applaud. I think that they've actually had a harder time to convince people and will continue to have a harder time to convince people in the West than I think the Chinese government has. And, and this kind of patriotic relationship between hackers and the Chinese community, uh, the Chinese government, sorry, also plays out in one of the final big differences that you focus on in your analysis. And, and that has to do with the way in which vulnerability research and findings that find their way to government agencies and are then exploited by them. And, and now this is, not new. Uh, last year, I had a great conversation with Dakota Curry and Kristen Del Rosso about the way that the Chinese government exploits software vulnerabilities and how that's different from the US approach. Now, you found in the leaks some s evidence that supports this understanding of the way in which these vulnerabilities are fed into the system. So tell us about those. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, that was a phenomenal episode, just to shout out to all of your listeners to go go uh, take a re-listen. But effectively, China's vulnerability disclosure requirements, as laid out by Dakota and Kristen, push companies and researchers to disclose software bugs to the Ministry of Public Security, i.e. the China's version of the FBI, if you could call it that, you know, I don't want to do too much mirror imaging, and the Chinese Ministry of State Security, their, their intelligence services. The chat logs in this in the ISIN leaks, predate these vulnerability disclosure laws. So you see both a confirmation and some interesting ad hoc things that the Ministry of Public Security was doing prior to these laws. Um, so basically, 
you could draw three conclusions from the leaks, uh, especially because of the ways that the founders have been talking about uh, these setups within their chat logs. The first is that the Chinese Ministry of Public Security are definitely getting access to exploits found by private companies at the Tianfu Cup. Now, I've mentioned the Tianfu Cup a couple times in the podcast, but haven't really talked about what that is. It's basically China's premier hacking competition and focusing just on vulnerabilities. So premier Chinese vulnerability researchers, as well as international uh, vulnerability researchers, come to China and they demonstrate that they can break into some of probably the most secure Western tech around. We're talking about iPhones, Androids, Windows machines, you know, most up-to-date systems that there are available. And instead of other hacking competitions internationally that say, great, now that you've demonstrated this, we'll go talk to the vendor so that way they could patch it, all of these vulnerabilities first go through <laughs> the government, the Chinese government. So the iSoon leaks show that the Chinese Ministry of Public Security Departments are getting access to any vulnerabilities or exploits found during the Tianfu Cup. And then if the vulnerabilities found at the Tianfu Cup aren't totally exploitable, say they cause the iPhone to crash, but you can't do anything with that crash to like get access to it, for example, um, they will give the code to their offensive contractors to see if they can try to figure out what to do with it to actually make it exploitable, uh, which is a seriously different <laughs> and frankly, very concerning set of revelations uh, that lines up not just with the vulnerability disclosure rules, but also um, previous reporting done by Patrick Howell O'Neill, uh, where people saw the a vulnerability found at the Tianfu Cup being used against the domestic Uyghur population uh, within China's Xinjiang province. So this approach to kind of vulnerability hoarding that that has serious implications for you know the the global ecosystem right so how could we change that i guess you know and and i'm moving here slightly into um i i want to think about what are some of the you know recommendations that you have you know based off these leaks uh there is a couple of opportunities coming up where the lessons learned from the leaks could be applied in order to shape some of our understanding of what does it mean to be irresponsible in cyberspace. Um, so it, when it comes to vulnerability hoarding and the way that governments use this, how can the leaks shape our understanding of what needs to be done, of what needs to be changed? Yeah, certainly. So when it comes to vulnerability hoarding, I will be the first one to say there's always going to be a legitimate reason for governments to hang on to certain vulnerabilities. Um, developing a, you know, quote unquote cyber arsenal, uh, can be very difficult. Bugs get burned. Totally understand that. However, when it comes to these particular target verticals, so we're talking about Windows, Apple, Safari, Chrome, other huge pieces of software that are used worldwide. If you are holding on to a vulnerability that is high impact uh, and you don't give it to a technology firm or, or the vendor specifically to patch, there's a high likelihood that somebody else is probably looking for the same type of bug. iOS or, or iPhones are used almost everywhere in the world. So there are probably many other intelligence services <laughs> that are trying to look at the uh, the iPhone source code to figure out uh, where the vulnerabilities are. And so if you found one, what's the likelihood that an intelligence service, you know, across the pond or or uh, in the Pacific will also find uh, that bug? So because of this uh, issue of parallel discovery, uh, something that in the industry we call a bug collision. You holding on to a bug may help you achieve national security goals, but at the risk of making the entire ecosystem less safe. And so the Western solution of, uh, to this is to create a vulnerability equities process. So basically bringing the defensive people as well as the intelligence people in the government into a room and debating what's the likelihood that this will cause serious harms versus what are the intelligence uh, benefits that we get from that. And while there are plenty of problems with the vulnerabilities equities process, it's much better than nothing, which is what the Chinese government currently uh, seems to have. Uh, just a, a purely intelligence-driven focus of hoarding as many vulnerabilities as possible in order to exploit them. 
Now, this week, the UN open-ended working group on responsible cyber behavior is convening in New York for their seventh session. And in this context, as a side event, there's a meeting that is focused on tackling the proliferation and responsible use of commercial cyber intrusion capabilities. And, and this is happening in the wake of the Paul Mall process, which is this UK initiative that is dedicated to tackling the proliferation and responsible use of commercial cyber intrusion capabilities. So if you had any advice to give the participants and considering your findings, what would you offer? What are some of the next steps that they could take? Certainly. Real shout out to the Palmwell process. I think that the UK and France and the follow-ons from the 2023 Summit for Democracy based out of the US are, are doing some phenomenal work. I'll say that the ISOON leaks provide a lot of different data points that bolster reasons for having norms around responsible cyber behavior, especially when it comes to the proliferation of these capabilities. So for example, while OEWG is happening this week, in a couple weeks from now, mid, mid to late March, the Summit for Democracy in 2024 is happening out of Korea. And so there are so many ways that the ISOON leaks touch treaty allies in the Pacific, as well as potential partners that would be on board that otherwise otherwise might not have been had these leaks not come out. So, for example, it's probably against the national security interests of South Korea, our treaty ally, that some of their best offensive security talent in the mobile space is working hand in hand with ISUN's prime contractor uh, through some mobile security conference MOSEC. Uh, it's also probably not phenomenal that Thailand, that runs one of the biggest Indo-Pacific military exercises with the United States, that a Chinese company, uh, you know, like I soon more worried about Series B funding and playing Mahjong than maybe some proper intelligence tradecraft, is running amok in Thailand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> and, you know, even for com countries like Vietnam and India, I soon has a lot of Indian hospital data. So what risks is the Chinese government taking on by letting private actors run wild in hospital networks? That feeds super well into some of the Pall Mall process concerns about risks of escalation. And then, you know, it's pretty embarrassing for Vietnam that they and China have such close technology relationships when Chinese private sector actors are selling Vietnam's internal government database for like 9,000 US dollars. <laughs> so what has been the response, if any at all, uh, to these leaks from the governments that have found themselves kind of, you know, in this embarrassing position, as you say. I haven't seen anything yet. And that's why I'm so surprised. I think, frankly, the hopefully the OVWG and the uh, Summit for Democracy will start elevating some of these now unclassified, fully open source uh, pieces of analysis uh, in these international fora, and they can further be used to, you know, push for creating alternatives to vulnerability hoarding, like VEP processes, or even creating norms against private sector hacking. I think also, Ohenia, you had a, a wonderful guest uh, from the International Committee of the Red Cross talk talking about concerns of private sector actors conducting hacking operations during wartime. Given the tension between the US and China, like, do we really want private sector companies to be, uh, you know, quote unquote, potential combatants in this space as well? So we know now, tell us a little bit, how do the principles uh, from the Palmer process frame future, you know, conversations around this issue? Yeah, certainly. And I frankly hope that the OEWG has, you know, taken a look at the Palmall process and, and looks at these guiding pillars, even though they're non binding, I still think that they're important. You know, accountability, precision, oversight, and transparency are the four. And this applies, you know, probably to both government end use and abuse as well as the companies conducting their own due diligence as well, right? And so, when we're talking about specifically China and the wider East Asian region, there's a sense of due diligence on <laughs> making sure that you're not contributing to the wider Chinese intelligence gathering capabilities, right? So you could set out guidelines for not, uh, for discouraging your local cybersecurity teams from participating in Tianfu Cup, for example. There were also some leaks within the ISOON documents about Chihu 360, again, uh, an investor of ISOON, potentially selling ISOON user PII. So if there is a foreign 
uh, or a partner government that is using Chihu 360, maybe encouraging them not to do so in the uh, the interest of transparency. And and bringing more of these leaks to light also helps with the transparency issue. So I think that there's quite a few interesting facets that the ISIN leak dovetails quite nicely into when it comes to uh, future non-proliferation or counter-proliferation efforts. So before we wrap up the conversation, I-, I wanted to give you some space. If you have any, you know, final thoughts that you want to leave our audience with, the floor is yours. Certainly. I'll say, uh, like I usually end most of these discussions with, is that hackers are people too. <laughs> and a lot of these capabilities and the decisions to sell to, to foreign governments or to governments that are known uh, human rights abusers are necessarily people-driven and business-driven decisions rather than focusing on the tools themselves. So I would encourage people in this space, researchers, policymakers, et cetera, to follow individuals rather than companies. Uh, companies may form, morph, go away, but the people usually stay the same. And then finally, when it comes to learning from the Chinese, not looking at the way that they hoard vulnerabilities, but instead looking at the way that they're co-opting talent, uh, partnering with more CTF teams, uh, and working with uh, the hacker communities rather than against them. Winona, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here as always. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get an ad-free version of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell. And your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osmond of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.